Welcome to Worship with the Salvation Army, Cardiff Canton. We noted last week that New Testament writers encourage us to be like Jesus. But long before Jesus was born, God urged the people of Israel to be like him. Be holy, because I am holy. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Paul writes that we should be imitators of God. Can we really be imitators of God? Loving Heavenly Father, we worship you today with thanks for all your provisions, for food and shelter, for family and friends. You have given us so many good gifts, but our world is far from perfect. Where there is suffering, equip us to bring comfort. When we are anxious, give us your peace and help us to recognise your presence. We are amazed, O Lord, that As small as we are, and as unholy as we sometimes feel, you invite us to be like you. So help us to be people who reflect your glory, share your love, and speak your words of comfort. We thank you for your word to us in Scripture, and for Jesus, your word made flesh. Keep us faithful to you and give us wisdom and compassion so that we can respond as the body of Christ to the needs around us. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.
how much of what makes me me is because of the things I've learned from the people around me. Did you copy your parents as you grew, acquiring their mannerisms or the way they just do things? What about their attitudes or how they handle problems? Has any of that rubbed off on you? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? There's a difference between copying people we see on television and copying people who devote their lives to nurture and care for us. When such folk invest themselves in our well-being, even if we are adopted and don't carry the same genes, something of them will likely shape us indelibly. Much of the copying we do from such people will be unconscious. The way we speak, how we walk, that furrowed brow when we concentrate, stuff just rubs off. Perhaps like me, you missed the anniversary of the D-Day landings. 77 years ago, last Sunday, the Allies pushed into Europe to begin the last chapter of the Second World War. But four years earlier, there was a very different story. Dunkirk, when 338,000 Allied troops were rescued from Hitler's advancing armies so that they could live to fight another day. Hitler might have called it a retreat, but Prime Minister Winston Churchill said that this rescue was a miracle of deliverance. The event had an impact on the psyche of our nation. Today, after 81 years, some people still talk about the Dunkirk spirit. Something of Dunkirk rubbed off on us. When the Israelites were rescued from slavery in Egypt and brought to the Promised Land, they looked back on that experience and saw in it a miracle of deliverance. It shaped Israel. We find echoes of the Exodus all over the scriptures, memories and allusions to it in the Old and New Testaments. The Exodus rubbed off on God's people. But crucially, God's people understood that this miracle of deliverance was not due to their own ingenuity. This miracle of deliverance was God's miracle, God's act of graciousness for his poor, oppressed and dispossessed people. And every time that Israel remembered the Exodus, they were challenged to learn from it. If God had been gracious to them, then they should be gracious to others. If God had loved them, then they should love others. You are to be my holy people, God said to this newly independent nation, as he used their time in the wilderness to familiarise them with freedom and to prepare them for the promised land. Be holy because I am holy, they were urged. God wanted his character to rub off on his people.
Good morning and here are the announcements for this week. This evening, as usual, at 6pm, we have our core prayer gathering on Zoom. Last week, we trialled having the, the prayer gathering both in person at the hall and on Zoom. And I've now decided that for the time being, we will continue with this prayer gathering just on Zoom. We are still working towards restarting a Sunday morning meeting at the hall, which will also be live streamed online. There are no other events this week, but just if I can give you a reminder for your diaries of a forward date, the core anniversary will be on November the 6th and 7th. In core family news, it is good news this week. I'm pleased to say that both Pam Beach and Mavis Deakin, who have both been in hospital, have now returned home. And can I wish a belated birthday congratulations to Beryl Warnham, who was 90 earlier this month. Thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you for the announcements. Here is an opportunity for us to give in our online offering. holy as I am holy, God had said. It was a bit too much of a challenge for most of God's people. To be holy means to be set apart for God, not run ragged at the world's beck and call, not blown about by every whim or fashion, but devoted to God's plan for your life. The Old Testament books after Exodus describe how, for centuries, God's people tried to be holy. And then Jesus was born, and he seemed to embody this holiness, this being like God, more perfectly than anyone else. Jesus resembled God so perfectly 
that his followers realised he was God. The Israelites looked back at their escape from Egypt and saw God in action. But later, when people looked at Jesus, they could see God in action again. If Exodus could be described as a miracle of deliverance, so too could Easter. And just as Israel needed to learn from God's actions in delivering them from slavery in Egypt, today we must learn from God's actions in Christ. So that is partly how you and I can begin to be holy as God is holy, by seeking to be like Jesus. Here is our Bible reading from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me.
Isaiah saw God, he was lost for words. The Jerusalem temple was the setting for his vision, the biggest building for miles around. And as he stood in that place, in his dream or perhaps physically, he was awestruck by the presence of God. This centre of religious devotion for people of God, this temple was big, but God was much bigger. Isaiah glimpsed our great big God, high and exalted. God appeared so big, so high and mighty to Isaiah that he says just the train of God's robe filled the temple. Might God have used the temple curtain which covered the inner sanctuary to feed into Isaiah's vision of God's robe? And what did our prophets hear? Seraphim, heavenly attendants of God, calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Their sound was like an earthquake, loud enough to shake the doorposts. We can hardly be surprised that as Isaiah stood in the presence of the Almighty God, he had a strong sense of his own inadequacies. Could it be that some particular failure came to Isaiah's mind as he trembled in the presence of God? He cries that his lips are unclean. Was he painfully aware of a past failure to say what God wanted him to say? Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Whether it was just a general feeling of smallness before God or a recognition of specific failings, Isaiah knew that he fell way short of the standard required for a mere mortal to stand in the presence of his maker. And as he stood in the presence of God, he knew that his community failed God too. I dwell among a people of unclean lips, he said. God, as the seraphim sang, was holy, holy, holy. Isaiah was not holy. His people were not holy. But God had a plan for Isaiah, and so God did something to remove the gulf which Isaiah felt between him and his creator. One of the seraphs flew to me, Isaiah says, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. This triple holy God, described by Hosea as a father full of compassion, this mighty God had spread a little bit of his holiness to Isaiah. And now, newly cleansed, he is able to hear the voice of God as he consults with his heavenly counsel. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah pipes up, Here am I, send me. Isaiah didn't make himself holy. God made Isaiah holy by touching his lips with that burning coal. After the Exodus, God had urged Israel to be holy as he is holy. But here, in Israel's prophet, God demonstrated that holiness is something which he can bestow. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us. Be holy as God is holy. Be imitators of God. Live a life of love just as Christ loved us. We must take those challenges seriously. 
in every part of our lives, we must seek to reflect God's character. By doing so, we are imitating God who calls us his children. We are copying from one who has invested something of himself in us. We are imitating the one in whose image we have already been created. We are being what we are. And although we really must seek with all our hearts to love as Christ loved us, to imitate God, to be holy even as God is holy, although we must daily endeavour to be what God has made us, to be what we are, Isaiah's encounter with God says that God does it in us. The angel took a coal and touched Isaiah's lips. I imagine in his vision that the coal would have glowed as it was lifted from the altar and taken from the presence of God. How long can the coal still glow outside of God's presence before its glory fades? How long before its power to cleanse the lips of Isaiah, is no more. The message of the Gospel is that God's glory in us need not fade. God's power in us need not wane. Be the children of God that you are, and through God's Holy Spirit, Christ will dwell in your hearts, and the glory of God the Father will continue to glow.
a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.